Piaget's cognitive constructivism theory. Many of us are very aware of who Piaget, Jean Piaget is, um, very popular back in the 30s and the 40s in his development with the understanding of cognition and early childhood and focused mostly on the learning of young children and had a lot of assistance in the understanding of IQ tests. Um, really relevant for my field as a school psychologist. Um, I had learned a lot about him in graduate school and found a lot of his information to be really relevant while assessing students with IQ and other assessments. He is often known for his ages and stages, um, which begins with the sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete operational, and then formal operational. Um, most people, if they hear of him, that's what they're going to think of. The cognitive constructivism is a different area that touches upon this. Um, and once people hear about it, they'll know, oh, I've heard of that, but may not know that Piaget is the one that created it. Um, so Piaget really looked at the cognitive development from birth and then up in the 11 years and beyond. So it went from being concrete, and then the learner went all the way up to the formal understanding or abstract thinking of any knowledge that they were presented with. Um, he had a lot of interest in how young children would come about with understanding the world around them, um, meaning when we understand something, we create a schema in our head. Um, he looked at understanding how humans can be given information but when you're first presented with it, you may not understand it. And in order to understand this information, you then put it into a schema. Um, you build your knowledge through your experience. He really had a focus on collaboration with learning rather than like a drill and test, drill and test method. Um, he believed in order for mental models to be put into a child's head, they had to really understand assimilation and accommodation. To get a schema in one's head, you do go through assimilation and accommodation. Um, I actually did a little test with my young child who is three, so this phase is very relevant for myself and understanding. And now that being a mom and a psychologist first, I get to put into practice um, everything that I learned, especially with this from birth to five years of age. Um, really interesting to see when a child's learning their schemas, at first, everything is a dog. Um, anything with four legs and fur may be considered a dog, uh, a cow, a horse. Um, and then they learn to assimilate knowledge that you may say, well, that may not be a dog, that's a cat. And then they have to accommodate um, in their schema and maybe make a new subgroup. I'm going to show now just a video um, that will clarify more about assimilation and accommodation. Really easy and basic, but just to see how a child will go through this and how they understand the information that's um, presented to them. Just give me one moment. Okay. Let's say that Jack is a young boy whose family owns a big shaggy dog named Rufus. One day, Jack visits his grandmother, who has just adopted a new old poodle. Even though this new dog looks quite different from Jack's familiar Rufus, Jack can still recognize that the poodle is also a dog. Jack put the new object, his grandmother's poodle, into an already established category, dog. The Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget called this assimilation. Let's say Jack next visited his aunt, who has a cat. Jack points to the cat and says, dog. This concept of dog, which successfully included both Rufus and his grandmother's poodle, is too broad. He calls anything that has four legs and a fur a dog. His father explains that this is a cat, and Jack adjusts his concept of dog accordingly. This is known as accommodation. Both are part of Peter Day's idea of adaptation, or the ways in which children learn about and categorize the world. Both assimilation and accommodation are related to the idea of schemas. Schemas are simply established patterns used to organize knowledge. Schemas underlie how we think in a lot of ways. For example, stereotyping involves accessing a schema about how one type of person usually acts and using it to predict their behavior. Assimilation and accommodation are the ways that children incorporate new information into their schemas. Jack filed Poodle under the existing head of dog, adding it to his schema of dog. But when Jack encountered a cat, he learned that his schema of dogs shouldn't include all four-legged furry animals, so he adjusted the schema to exclude cats. We've been talking about assimilation and accommodation in terms of language, 
but Piaget actually intended the terms to apply to other kinds of developmental learning as well. He characterized an infant's desire to suck on everything around them as a more abstract form of assimilation. The infant's schema of the world is pretty limited. He can interact with it primarily by sucking, and so he assimilates all objects into the schema of suckable things, just as Jack assimilated all four-legged furry animals into dog. As infants grow, they begin to modify their schemas and further divide objects into suckable, grabbable, pokeable, and so on. This is the developmental analog of accommodation, and it can be also compared to Jack's modification of dog to exclude cat. Piaget argued that the conflict between assimilation and accommodation drove intellectual growth. Accommodation helps children develop more sophisticated systems of categorizing information, since new and modified schemas are created in response to objects not fitting. But assimilation allows children to gather information quickly and to interact with it in ways for which their best development is suited. Together, assimilation and accommodation work to help children learn quickly and with increasing sophistication. That should give a little bit more clarity on um, a young child understanding what a schema, um, how they create their schemas. Um, so you understand now that seeing a cat and a dog or a cow, so this child said a dog. A dog must be anything with four legs. Well, he was introduced to that cat, so he made an accommodation, and now he has a different schema or subgroup um, in his mind. And the next time he will see it, he'll understand that's two separate areas. Um, the basis of cognitive constructivism, really, it's all about adaptation. Um, so we're constantly adapting daily, especially the younger that you are, you're going through this phase rapidly. And then the older we get, um, we're not really accommodating too much. It's kind of a funny way to think about we get set in our ways or opinions. Um, and maybe we do need to accommodate, but we're often not. And in the video, the woman mentioned about how you will often see that um, prejudices. Um, that is probably another term of saying false assimilation um, and then failure to accommodate when you maybe see one issue in your life or an experience and then you fail to say, well, maybe that's not going to happen the next time. Um, and maybe in our middle school and our high school students, that's how they are either failing to assimilate and accommodate or they are actively doing so. Um, okay, so we went over schemas. Um, another example would be if you had like a two-year-old child looking at a book um, and they see a cow from the picture and then later maybe at the zoo you take them and they see a large animal such as maybe a moose. Um, so you see the moose, the child probably around the age of two would say, oh look, a cow. Um, then the adult would introduce to them and say, no, that's not a, that's not a cow, that is a moose. So they're assimilating this information. And then the child will then accommodate the schema for large shaggy animals to be a moose. So then they might see a camel or a shaggy horse and then call it moose. So you're constantly changing and adding as you assimilate. Um, and it, it, it happens frequently with young students. So how does this relate to us um, as educators, as teachers, um, daily in the classroom? You are in elementary school, you're going to be using it and seeing it um, quite frequently in the kindergarten years or pre-K years. Um, and it is going to be occurring as they get in the older grades, you're just not as aware of it. So instead of giving lectures, um, Piaget saw everyone to be as a facilitator in the role of learning with the student um, when it came to understanding their information. So it takes away the focus from the teacher and lecture and puts it upon the student and their learning. Um, the resources and lesson plans that must be initiated for this learning to take place um, are very different than the traditional learning. Instead of telling or, um, I mean, specific guiding, the teacher will be asking questions. They will almost in a sense try to be pulling the information from their students. Um, they won't answer the questions and they will align it with the curriculum um, and they'll make it that the student comes to the conscious awareness on their own. So that makes the child more responsible for their learning rather than a drill and a test. 
Here's the information, commit it to your memory, grab it from your long-term retrieval, take the test, and then you dump it. Um, he believed that if children did learn in this manner, that they actually are going to commit it long-term memory rather than just a short-term memory. Teachers are continuously in conversation with their students. They create the learning experience that is open in new directions and deepening the needs of the students as learning progresses. Teachers follow the theory of constructivism. If they choose to do so, they challenge the student by making them effective critical thinkers and not being a mere teacher or a mentor or maybe even a coach. Um, so he, he constantly in his work, facilitator and a collaborator. Um, and I, you know, immediately when I was reading about this, I thought how much differentiated instruction really goes hand in hand with this. Um, 20 years ago, I would say we were more in that whole class curriculum um, teaching approach and we didn't do small group or we didn't differentiate instruction based on our child's ability or um, where they were at in the curriculum. So not only can the teacher be the facilitator, he talks about doing small group instruction with these students and showing how um, they've become their own facilitators in their learning. So I talked about self-monitoring uh, as well as in differentiated instruction and our pre-referral processes and everything in our classroom. We talk about monitoring our students' progress, tweaking it, changing the intervention. Um, he also talks about self-monitoring, um, which then allows the child to monitor their progress and then highlight any difficulties they're seeing and they can also analyze their own study habits. So strategies in the classroom to encourage the style of learning. Um, what can we do? Obviously, like I mentioned, we can work together. They can aid in one another's answers, um, help one another come up with the correct answer and then correct one another. They can designate one student as an expert in each of their subgroups when they're working in the classroom and allowing students to work in groups and pairs um, and research controversial topics, which then they can present to the class. So um, controversial topics with the older students as such middle and high school will be a wonderful way for them to accommodate their schemas. Um, often our, our older learners in school, um, their opinions, maybe they may think that they are set in stone, but as they are presented with more controversial issues that they maybe have to really think and challenge their schema, they can then learn to accommodate along with simulating. Um, so technology, uh, it's funny to think that constructivism is coming back more so now because we have different areas and ways of reaching students in our teaching methods. Um, instead of just a chalkboard and a teacher as that coach, um, we have the facilitator in many different modes, audio, visual. We have the computers. We have whiteboards in some of our schools where students can come up and they touch the board or they interact with the board with the teacher themselves and their peers. Um, a lot of the software we had in the 70s and 80s was based on more behavioral principles, but now our new multimedia um, software is based on more constructivist theories. Um, and it's that we get tools with which to accomplish it, all these goals within the classroom. So just some questions that I I thought about when, when I think about this lesson and things that are going to affect us in the classrooms. Um, the one that really popped to my mind is when you're thinking about young children learning in the classroom and the way that we instruct them. Um, if they are seen as a learner and the environment is open to them rather than a teacher teaching about the environment that they're in. I immediately thought of a Montessori education when thinking of constructivism, um, just for the fact that in this setting, they are often teachers. They don't even think of themselves as a teacher. They think of themselves more as a facilitator and they mingle and move around a room to see how the child's learning and gently guide them in a direction maybe that may benefit what they're focused on at that moment. I personally think it's a fabulous way to learn. In my um, background, I will, would come across a lot of the time where young students would come from two, maybe three years of a Montessori education um, with lots of lots of wonderful knowledge, but we would have quite a transition between that pre-K and kindergarten year because a kindergarten typical public school classroom is very different than your Montessori environment. 
Um, kindergarten is very structured. There are certain times of the day we do things, and we usually do them as whole groups, such as circle time. Um, even eating in the Montessori classroom, children can choose when they eat. Um, so I often have wondered, would Montessori in our schools, are we, are we working more that way a little bit, or are we staying to more of our structured, um, we move through a classroom together, we are guided by a schedule given to us. Um, another one that may be some questions that I could pose to you as if you have anyone that's in middle and high school um, teaching currently, if you would think uh, back to the schemas we talked about with assimilation and accommodation and how our children are creating these schemas, do you find that older students are adjusting their schemas when they assimilate anything that you are teaching them? May it be controversial or just regular general stuff through the day of life or education in your classroom that you're teaching them? Do you find that they're open or willing? Um, in what areas? Is it social that they learn to accommodate? Uh, is it prejudices? Um, or is it just general knowledge that maybe they thought they knew, but they had missing pieces of it? Um, and do they have that aha moment where, oh wow, all these years I've had this idea and I was committed to that idea and now I'm open to changing that. Um, Lastly, uh, let's see here, Piaget classroom is an important role. Um, it gets kids to be spontaneous, it gets them to explore, it gets to open up that line of communication. Um, I, it, there are views on both sides of it that some believe that Piaget doesn't really have a good understanding of the classroom. He has a better understanding of the child early development, but not how that would relate into the classroom. Um, I personally feel that this is a fabulous idea to understand what different areas the child's in, how they're creating and learning from the environment around them, and then how we can help adjust and help them accommodate and get through different um, areas that we present to them and help them better understand it. I think that's it and thanks for listening.